And uh, now next one to speak is uh, Massimiliano. You are back here. Yes. yes. Good. You will talk about smart data system, digital interoperability, and trust in food supply chain. Yes, I share my screen. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome. I am uh, Massimiliano Pirani, and uh, uh, with my, I can say, interdisciplinary group, made uh, also from uh, Professor Lucas Palazzi and Alessandro Carbonari and Alessandro Cucchiarelli, we are uh, leading the World Package 5 uh, in the ENAF project, and the title and so the objective of the World Package 5 is the smart data system. And we present uh, um, our concept towards uh, digital interoperability and trust in food supply chain. So what is a, a smart data system? Um, rather than, uh, than making a, a, an exact definition, uh, a rigorous definition, we would like to start with the connotation of the terms. So the interpretation that we would like to, to, to give to these terms. For example, smart for us means intelligent and simple at the same time. And data is uh, analysis, of course, analysis, data analysis, but also control. So data are used both for inspection, but data are also fed back into loops to make, in order to make control at several levels of uh, um, the systems and the processes. And then, yes, of course, we have the system. So what we intend with uh, a system, for us, doing system is inclusion. A system is including several several aspects several uh, dimensions of the problem of the processes and of the machineries that are beyond the uh, food chain and uh, um, its uh, its behavior and also this inclusion has to produce trust between the actors and the agents that collaborate and in the in the in the in the sub, um, food supply chain so the overall smart data system objective in enough is of course to lower the total emissions of ghg but at the same time we have to raise uh, the achievement in the sustainable development goals of the united nations and in particular these ones but not limited to uh, which is a very complex uh, target and so uh, the vision that we put forth is the management of such a complexity and to do that we see the farm to fork supply chain has a complex system of systems and processes. So we tend to make the circular processing in the, uh, uh, along the, the whole life cycle of the, the, the supply chain and the food product has um, a multi-level <clears throat> and a fractal in, in some sense um, system. So a system of system where components participate to the construction of a whole, of a, of a complex whole. And the reductionist cannot be used uh, directly to solve the complex problems that we find in, in this kind of problems. So our approach is anyway to, to divide and conquer in some way, and for it, each process we would like to do uh, improve continuously 
like in the case in philosophy used in uh, you know in the in industry in special uh, in, in special way in the automotive since the the 70s so with this philosophy we would like to lower ghg emissions to higher reputation to higher uh, to, to, to go towards higher dependability, quality, availability, trustability, and of course, overall sustainability, that means also ethics inside. And this um, involves all the actors and the agencies that are artificial or not in this, in this, uh, <clears throat> in this uh, play, play, playground. And doing that, with doing that, we will uh, possibly achieve um, augmented uh, global quality, increased global quality. And at the same time, we can create a chain of trust. So the main concept in the smart data system, which is uh, called also SDS with an acronym, is uh, to shape a digital and virtual backbone of services. So a uh, holistic ecosystem of runtime services in order to let the stakeholders of enough interoperate in a unified and most of all co-creative way with sustainability inside. We start for this project from already achieved results from other research and partnership with with companies that we can say they start from trl four to six in order to arrive to something that will be clearly distinguished with respect to other digital platforms we have a host of digital platforms around and uh, I, I will talk about that uh, briefly after but what we have to what we are targeting is to achieve impact of course first, first of all but to achieve that in a unique way so the keywords that we have collected so far in our first 10 months of uh, of activity in the in this work package are low carbon footprint of course low ghg emission but also real time is another issue the trust is another issue and the human centric aspect of these productions are uh, very important and we also uh, understood that the problems that we are facing are have a social technical nature and of course circularity and sustainability so the chap the supply chain becomes some sort of a chain of trust in a in not not directly but by construction so we have uh, yes you can see the activities that, uh, that 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 compose a supply chain a typical activities but the number and the and the and the, the, the quality and the nature of them can vary between a supply chain and another. But uh, apart from this, for each of these aspects, for each of these phases, we can, of course, get a real time data and act in the short term in order to optimize, in order to control processes, in order to, 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 to improve production efficiency and in order, of course, to lower uh, the emissions, but this also um, um, belongs to another holistic management and control layer. And in this management and control layer, we rely on indicators, indicators that give to us some uh, indexes about the achievement of reputation, performance in general, and sustainability. And they boil down in, uh, in the long term into a, a chain of trust that is composed by different nodes put together, even nodes that are of very, very, very different nature. For example, nodes that act in the, in the social 
in the social side we have seen from other work package for example the work on uh, on the business side on the, the behaviors of a consumer and other nodes that are purely technical mach machines and production systems and so on and we are trying to glue them together in order to uh, create uh, a value that becomes a chain of trust but the overarching approach is uh, is a lazy approach we can say it is in the in the in the kanban philosophy philosophy so the kanban is a pool production system so we produce results as soon as they manifest as soon as they um, uh, take importance so we don't know from the start which uh, and how uh, to take all many of them but we have to produce uh, a system, a systematic way and, and a methodology that can answer continuously to them. And so what we are going to sell, not just another digital platform gadget, but we, because we don't, do not want to reinvent the wheel, but we want to express our uniqueness by bringing about results and experience from past uh, European projects and other company projects participating in the work package, like, uh, for example, Visible Digital and Electrica company, and drive them up to innovation. And we focus on the new worldviews emerging from enough. So the principles abide by, for example, things like smart data models, uh, which are a focus in the, in the fiber um, in the, in the fiber framework. And so we don't just don't want to standardize, but be agile and standardize. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to use as much as possible real cases. We want to be open, of course, don't be specific, uh, absolutely specific, but be uh, ready to, um, in the Kanban philosophy, to similar and affine process. And we uh, want to be, um, local and self-contained, self which is a, a, also which is a, a concept of flatness in some sense. And we want to uh, follow sustainability as a key. So what we are going to exploit at the end of the project, uh, we think that we will produce a DevOps rather than a specific digital, digital platform. So a factory of platforms. A, plat a platform of platforms. So a set of practices also that combines software development, management, operational technology, and so on. And to shorten the system development life cycle and provide continuous delivery with high software quality as in the multi-part and multi-sided business uh, kind of framework. So the ambitious role of the smart data system is to conciliate the HABA and the MABA that are concepts that come from the, the, 50, the 50s. And the HABA is uh, identify what humans are better at and, what and the MABA is what machines are better at. And so the SDS will be the matchmaker between the two. So construction rather than reduction, the whole rather than the part, system thinking rather than reduction in system theory, system, rather than system engineering, abduction rather than deduction and induction, and hypothesis rather than hypothesis testing, and what if kind of reasoning rather than observe, plan, do, check, Scenario simulation rather than scenario verification, model refinement, model reduction, and the complexity rather than complicatedness. And so we would like to focus on prescription at the end rather than only predictions. And so we will use technologies, of course, but technologies that will be in contact, in straight, in a close contact with, with the human user and to, to constitute a, a whole of the two. So we are now at the phase of the specification still of our solutions. So we have made a machinery of this, of this, of these specifications themselves 
and so in the Kanban philosophy we'll leave this specification open also for, for the future. And we finally want to, to have a look in our construction uh, to comply with the industry 4.0 and 5.0 and the many technological and uh, scientific aspects that uh, uh, are already are already there like the blockchain for example the asset administration share the fiber platform cyber physical system that are a foundation of concept foundational concept in industry 4.0 the rami 4.0 which is the um, standard now that everyone is following there and the digital twins technology of course and last but not least the extended reality so thank you and uh, if you have questions i'm available yes thank you very much um if anyone has any questions you can add it in the chat uh, and i think we will then go on to the next presentation which is from silvia minetto and she will talk about overview of the demonstrators what has been done the first year and further plans thank you christina I will try to share my screen now. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we see it. Very good. OK, thank you very much. So thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome to Work Package 6. Work Package 6 is dedicated to the demonstration of best technologies in key products and cross sectors. And now we will try to explain what it means. So as you see from the picture in the, in the left hand of the screen, Work Pack 6 stays more or less in the center of the, of the project. It collects uh, uh, information from the other work packages, the ones that you have already that have already been presented and delivers uh, uh, to outputs uh, to work package eight, which is about the communication, dissemination and exploitation. The objective of Work Package 6 is to demonstrate relevant technologies for the decarbonization of the European food industry. And these technologies need to be available. So they have a, a development stage, a, technolog a technological readiness level, which is ranges from five to, se uh, to, to seven. So we want to provide the European food industry with tools to help them to decarbonize. And we want to communicate the outputs, the outcomes of uh, um, this demonstration campaign widely to all the stakeholders of the, of the project, which are uh, food companies, but also uh, manufacturers of uh, um, technological systems and all the interests, uh, interest groups. How do we work in Work Package 6? Work Package 6 is based on the demonstration of technologies and strategies. Uh, uh, so we select uh, relevant technologies and implement into a specific demonstrator, so a real system which is working to serve uh, process or a product according to the metrics that is represented below and I will go into details um, in a while. This demonstration takes place in a relevant or operational environment, I mean in the lab or in the field, directly in the field, depending on the development stage of the technology itself. So we implement this technology, we measure uh, the performances um, the, um, with a specific uh, attention to energy flows. Uh, we um, evaluate the uh, energy savings uh, and the energy savings and the, car um, the carbon emission savings. And then we are able to communicate and disseminate this, these results. Uh, since the beginning, we have made this, uh, designed this matrix where we have identified some key products, um, which uh, they are products which require a dedicated um, supply chain. And in the vertical, let me select the pointer here, in the vertical axis is here, we have the main links of the food supply chain. So process, transport, storage and domestic. So we try to select demonstrators to cover in the best way this matrix. At the moment, we have 
uh, 18 uh, demonstrators running, uh, some in the lab, some in out in the field. They are at a different uh, um, progress stage and we are evaluating a few new demos to cover uh, as much as possible these, uh, these metrics. Behind each of these uh, uh, demonstrators, there are one or more technologies and that we have selected and I've tried to group these technologies according to the action that they are taking. So you can see in these uh, four colored boxes uh, that we have technologies that are uh, reducing energy demand, optimizing energy flows and eliminating fossil fuels. We are also working on improving energy efficiency, so having the same result with, with less energy expense. The use of sustainable working fluids and materials for long term sustainability and the improvement of preservation conditions for the re reduction of the food waste. <laughs> so here are the technologies that we have identified and uh, the arrows, they refer um, to the to the boxes above. So uh, they recall each color, uh, the, the action that this technology is, uh, is taking. Uh, so we have high temperature heat pumps, heat recovery, renewables, uh, use of electrical refrigeration system for transport. For example, these technologies, they are mainly targeting the reduction of energy demand, the optimization of energy flows and the elimination of fossil fuels. But they are also work to improve energy efficiency and to promote the use of sustainable working fluids. We have then thermal energy storages in combination with demand side response dynamic controlled atmosphere, freeze drying, brine freezing, blast freezing, super chilling. These are all methods that targeting the improved uh, preservation condition, but at the same time, um, um, giving the uh, space to the implementation of energy efficient solutions and use of sustainable working fluids and materials. We have climate neutral packaging, which is uh, uh, mainly working on um, the use of sustainable, uh, um, of sustainable uh, materials. Throughout the project, we, the work package, we work with advanced components and advanced control uh, strategies to integrate and manage all these technologies. In this table, I have now tried to, to show how the technologies that we have selected can replace the present technologies, which are uh, sometimes highly uh, emitting. So, for example, high temperature heat pumps, they can replace fossil fuel burners. Then we have integrated management of thermal flows, thermal energy storages or heat recovery. They work to um, to eliminate what is normally happening now in the refrigeration industry, which is or in the process industry, which is the fact that we have separate chilling or freezing and eating. So we chill, we cool down a product, we reject it outdoors or we waste it and at the same time we use fossil fuels to eat up warm uh, water or to produce steam. Of course, natural refrigerants, they can replace synthetic refrigerants in almost all applications of the sector. Uh, electrical driven refrigerating system for transport, they are in line with the new uh, trend for uh, transport uh, vehicles, which is uh, electrification. Uh, so we need to develop uh, systems that are compatible with this new uh, way of, uh, of uh, driving the, the vehicles. We have demand side response and thermal energy storages that are um, trying to solve the problem of the rigid uh, electrical energy supply. So uh, we try to have a flexible in, um, interaction with the grid. Climate neutral packaging, of course, is replacing high carbon packaging materials. Dynamic controlling atmosphere is improving controlled atmosphere for a better um, uh, improve the storage condition. Brine freezing and blast freezing uh, are replacing long time freezing by air, acting both on energy consumption and uh, product quality. Vacuum drying is replacing air drying and super chilling is a new uh, it's a new way of storing meat, especially meat below zero to improve its quality and its shelf life. So after this overview of the technologies that have been selected inside the work package six, uh, I, I've tried to, to, uh, to use them as bricks 
to build up these, uh, the 2050 food chain. So all this technology can fit one or more of the links of the chain, pr processing, transport, storage, and again, retail, last mile delivery and domestic. Uh, we can fit all these technologies inside one or more of these uh, links and try to build in this way the 2050 food chain. Overall, of course, we have advanced control that manage and integrate the different steps. So what have we achieved so far? So during these first years, um, many uh, demonstrators have been implemented. We have 18, as I said, running, and we can have an overview on the first results. I will now, um, I've picked up some of them, uh, and I, I will go quickly through the results that we have achieved so far. So this first one is a high temperature heat pump. It's a hybrid ammonia and water absorption compression heat pump, which has the goal of producing steam at 150 degrees, so eliminating completely, uh, completely uh, fossil fuel burners. Of course, this is developed for meat in this specific case. It is in the lab, so it, the development stage being, brings us to the lab in this case. Uh, it is focused on meat, but of course, the production of steam at 150 degrees can be useful for many products and many processes. Uh, the leading partner is NT, NTNU, together with Sintef. They have uh, built the test facility, installed all the sensors, the commissioning has been carried out, and uh, the system is now charged with ammonia and water, and uh, tomorrow morning there will be the first test. So the uh, they, they will turn up, uh, turn on the system. Um, we can now mo move to the field to an example of demo in the field. This is about dairy. This demo um, is installed in Norway and it is part of three demos dealing with the dairy factories. Um, after my presentation, uh, Philip will illustrate, we go deeper inside um, the technologies that are demonstrated for for the area in particular, we'll focus um, <clears throat> on a demo which is located in Austria. This demo is, uh, as I said, is running in the field. That the technology behind is a CO2 chiller with heat recovery. Um, so we are here demonstrating heat recovery and thermal energy storages, uh, energy storage to, uh, together with the use of natural working fluid. The idea is to recover the heat for cleaning in place and domestic hot water production while chilling water, which is necessary for the processing in the factory. Uh, the field test is running. Uh, the partner, in this case, uh, uh, Sintef Ocean together with um, NTNU, uh, they have uh, a Roros Merit. They have installed the, the monitoring uh, system. They are verifying all the measurement equipment and the monitoring platform, and we are waiting for the first results in a very short time. This is a very new demonstrator uh, which has started only a couple of months ago but we have already some results it is uh, uh, about uh, processing of fish brine freezing so the idea is to use brine freezing to reduce the energy demand and shorten the freezing time in fish freezing um, the, the the prototype is um, is already operational and the first test that's been conducted in a very short time uh, they have uh, uh, targeted the quality so of the product, so they have tested the flexibility of fish after freezing in brine, and they have focused on the packing in boxes, which is necessary for the next steps in the process. We also know that fruit and vegetables, they require a specific, uh, specific arrangements for uh, their preservation in cold rooms to prolong their life. And this demonstrator, which is uh, um, located in Belgium, it's applying uh, respiratory quotient dynamic control atmosphere to prolong the, uh, to reduce the food losses and to reduce at the, at the same time the energy demand. 
Uh, we have six uh, commercial uh, uh, rooms, very large rooms, uh, where fruit is really stored. This is uh, at um, demo running in the field. Uh, they have installed the devices. You can see the pictures in the um, uh, on the right hand of the of the slide. Uh, and uh, the um, the program, the, the the plan is to uh, collect the samples of fruit to m measure the quality of the uh, of the fruit in comparison with traditional uh, control atmosphere storage and at the same time the partners they have uh, set up a plan to measure the energy savings so to uh, evaluate what is the possibility in uh, reducing the energy consumption this is another example of demo which is running uh, we it is it's about the transportation as i said the transportation sector is moving towards electrification so uh, elimination of uh, uh, combustion uh, engines uh, so far the refrigeration unit uh, in uh, in refrigeration transport was driven by combustion engine the idea is now, now is to have a unit which is electrical driven with integration with the uh, PV panels on the top of the um, of the truck and uh, uh, using only natural working fluids, in this case, carbon dioxide. Uh, the partners, uh, CNR, mainly CNR and the Silesian University, so far they have designed the circuit with a two-stage temperature, uh, medium temperature and low temperature for both fresh and frozen uh, products. Um, uh, the Silesian University has optimized a specific component, which is an advanced component, uh, two phase ejectors, uh, ejector both for uh, medium temperature and one for LT application. And uh, um, the, the demonstration will take place both in the laboratory and finally in the field. And I would like to conclude with uh, a demo which has to do with the retail and with the thermal energy storage and demand side response. In this case, we have a cabinet here, a display cabinet for supermarket, uh, where a thermal energy storage has been uh, integrated inside the air channel so that it can be charged during the on periods of the cabinet and it can uh, allow the power supply to be switched off according to the uh, flexible integration with the grid. And uh, the partners uh, in Rai and Depta have measured both the energy consumption, which is lower with storage unit than it is with the traditional cabinet. And they have also checked that the product is still at the safe value if the power is cut off for a certain period, for a few hours. Of course, this design will undergo further optimization during the project. So <clears throat> I've concluded you can find more details about the demonstrators in, a, in the website. And uh, OK, that's uh, all about this, uh, the work package six. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a large work package and a lot of information, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy to summarize it. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that leads to us to to one of the, the demonstrators, Philip. You will talk about demo three: application of a high temperature heat pump for waste heat utilization. So yeah, thank you, Christina, for for the introduction. I will I will talk about the application of a high temperature heat pump for waste heat to utilization. This is uh, one of our demonstrators in the dairy sector. It's uh, one of the, the three identified demonstrators. One was already mentioned by uh, Silvia. This was the optimization of the energy flows at Horace Marit. And the second one is the cold water and steam high temperature heat pump at Yeo Valley. And today we will look into a little bit more detail into the high temperature heat pump at Enstermilch where the high temperature heat pump was already integrated in an existing chiller to supply a cleaning in place system. Uh, just a few words uh, about the, the company Enstermilch. So it's uh, located uh, here in, in Austria, in the middle of Austria, and it was uh, funded in 1902 and is a dairy and cheese factory. Uh, the technical facts about the demonstrator, there is an existing chiller which uh, uses the natural refrigerant ammonia, NH3, and uh, this supplies ice water at around 1 degree Celsius with a maximum cooling capacity 
of uh, 900 kilowatt. And directly into this uh, driller, a high temperature heat pump has been integrated by their project partner Equans, or formerly Engie, uh, which uh, supplies water at a temperature of around 90 degrees Celsius, which is suitable for a kinning in place system and has a maximum heating capacity of approximately 550 kilowatts. So just, just a few words about uh, the uh, heat pump process or a high temperature heat pump. So high temperature heat pump can utilize waste heat on a, a low temperature level and lift it up to a temperature level suitable for uh, processes and uh, can supply uh, this heat for, for example, in, in, in our case for a cleaning in place system by a small amount of electrical power. Uh, just to the to the concept of, of a heat pump, we, we have a compressor which uh, lifts the refrigerant to a higher pressure, then a condenser where the refrigerant is uh, liquefied by releasing uh, heat to a, to a heat sink, and then we have a throttle where the refrigerant is brought to the low pressure before it uh, can utilize the waste heat or the low temperature heat uh, in the evaporator. Uh, high temperature heat pump, uh, the definition is uh, not so clear, but uh, there are definitions of about uh, 80 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Celsius uh, supply temperature, where it is uh, called as a high temperature heat pump, and this uh, temperature is uh, suitable to supply uh, processes in the industry. The efficiency of such a heat pump is defined by the, the heating capacity divided by the electrical power input. Uh, it's also shown uh, the process in a TH or a pH diagram. We can see that the refrigerant from state point one to state point two uh, is uh, lifted in the pressure before it is uh, condensed here in the condenser by releasing heat to the heat sink. And then the refrigerant is throttled to the low pressure. And afterwards, it's evaporated here in the evaporator. You can also see the reduction of the heat source temperature and the increase of the heat sink temperature. Uh, what are now the possibilities and the advantages of uh, waste heat utilization? So in general, we, we have a conventional refrigeration system, which is uh, needed to supply cooling capacity for the cooling processes, and the waste heat is usually um, rejected to the ambient by cooling towers. And in the project, uh, in ENOUGH, we are looking into this waste heat utilization with a high temperature heat pump. So parts of the waste heat or the whole waste heat can be uh, used as a low temperature heat pump, uh, a low temperature heat source for, for the heat pump, and which can be lifted up to a temperature level suitable for this process heat supply. This can uh, save uh, CO2 emissions and also uh, steam systems or hot water systems can be substituted, which are normally uh, driven by natural gas. Coming over to our system and, and the concept, we see here our uh, chiller with the compressor and, and the cooling tower and the evaporator, which supplies the uh, cold water for the, the process at around one degree Celsius. And this was the demonstrator or the, the system, which was already running and the high temperature heat pump has been directly integrated into this uh, chiller after the low pressure compressor. The refrigerant is taken here to the high pressure compressor, lifted up to a pressure and, and temperature level suitable for process heat supply. So here for the heat sink of up to 90 degrees Celsius. And afterwards, the refrigerant flows back here to the chiller. A more detailed uh, description of, of our system, uh, we have here this, this conventional refrigeration cycle. And for, for the original system, the heat was dissipated by means of a cooling tower. The chiller uses a, a flooded evaporator with a natural circulation. And in the evaporator, the ice water is supplied at around one degree Celsius and this maximum cooling capacity of 900 kilowatt. So I have a little bit of an imagina imagination of uh, 
the system, you, you can see a picture of our uh, chiller. You can see the low pressure compressor, uh, the medium pressure receiver, the low pressure separator, and the uh, insulated evaporator. And into this uh, chiller, the high temperature heat pump uh, has been integrated as already shown in the simplified scheme before. So here, after the low pressure compressor and here before the medium pressure receiver, the high temperature heat pump was directly integrated and there were also two valves integrated to guarantee an independent operation of the chiller because the chiller is operated 24 seven and the high temperature heat pump is operated on demand. And uh, the heat here of the high temperature heat pump is rejected uh, to, the, to the heat sink, to the high temperature heat sink, which is used here for the cleaning in place system. And the water inlet temperature, the design temperature is around 60 to 80 degrees Celsius, the inlet temperature and the outlet temperature of the hot water, approximately 75 to 90 degrees Celsius. The high temperature heat pump was not that simple as it is uh, shown in, in this figure here. It consists here of a, of a de-superheater where the refrigerant is de-superheated, a condenser where the refrigerant is liquefied, a high pressure receiver and a subcooler. So also I have some uh, pictures here of uh, our high temperature heat pump. Uh, you can see it here uh, with the high pressure compressor, uh, the insulated, uh, the superheater condenser, high pressure receiver and the subcooler. The uh, heat pump was used to, to supply here this uh, cleaning in place system, which consists of uh, a lye and an acid and to buffer demand peaks, uh, buffer storage with around 12 cubic meters uh, was also integrated. To have a sufficiently uh, monitoring of the system, especially the high temperature heat pump was equipped with a lot of uh, sensors. So there's our pressure sensors, temperature sensors and uh, volume flow meters. And uh, you can also see the Pro says here in this, uh, for example, pH diagram here on the bottom, uh, the chilling process and on top here, the process of the high temperature heat pump. Uh, regarding the current status, uh, it's uh, demonstrated that this already in the field and in operation. So we have extensive measurement data of the chiller, high temperature heat pump and the tip. There is a, a data analysis tool for the monitoring and the simulation model uh, has been set up of the chiller and the high temperature heat pump and the storage tank, which is already validated with measurement data. For the monitoring, a few uh, key figures have been defined. So the efficiency of the chiller with the uh, cooling capacity uh, divided by the electric um, electrical power of the low pressure compressor uh, the same for the high temperature heat pump and there has also been a, a seasonal performance factor defined which is the ratio of the uh, amount of heat supplied divided uh, by the electrical energy needed. And for the system also efficiency has been defined which combines the chiller and the high temperature heat pump. To give you an example of an operating of a day of operation, I've uh, taken one uh, here with a, a target outlet temperature of 90 degrees Celsius. So a supply temperature of the heat pump of uh, 90 degrees Celsius. What we can see here is that the chiller is operated the whole day with different uh, power. So that's what we can see here and uh, in the uh, Bottom uh, figure, we can see the capacities, so the uh, cooling capacity through the whole day. And in the top figure, there is the heat source temperature, which is constant at around this one degree Celsius. The high temperature heat pump was uh, operated on demand, so if it is needed, and this is the electrical power we can see here, and as well in the in the bottom figure, 
the capacity of the heat pump, which was supplied to the cleaning in place system. Both systems are connected uh, with uh, one pressure level. So this is the, the pressure level of the, the, the condensation pressure level of the chiller corresponds to the evaporation pressure level of the high temperature heat pump. And this is what we can see here, the different pressure levels. So this is the, the low pressure levels, the evaporation pressures of the chiller and the condensation pressure here of the, the high temperature heat pump. And in between, there is a medium pressure level, which is raised here during the operation of the high temperature heat pump, which can also be adjusted and can influence the system. I will show uh, uh, the influence in, in one of the next slides. Yeah, during uh, the whole day of operation, around 2,700 kilowatt hours have been supplied by the high temperature heat pump, which means that uh, this was less needed by the natural gas, which usually supplies our cleaning in place system. Uh, just have a look on the interaction of the chiller and the high temperature heat pump. So as I said before, the chiller and the high temperature heat pump are here connected at this medium uh, pressure level. And uh, what happens if we increase this medium pressure level and the influence the operation of the heat pump? What we can see here is that the capacity of the high temperature heat pump can be significantly increased by also uh, increasing the efficiency of the heat pump. But this has the drawback that the efficiency of the chiller decreases. Both have an effect on the system efficiency. So in this case, increasing the uh, medium pressure level uh, causes a decrease of the system efficiency. And this is what we would like to look into it in more detail of the optimization of the system efficiency and the influence of the overall system. And therefore, a transient simulation model has been set up in the software Damola Modelica with TIL. And uh, this was already validated with measurement data. And the focus is on the charging and discharging of these uh, buffer storages and the interaction of the system, so the chiller and the high temperature heat pump. I will only show you one example of the, the simulation uh, in comparison with the experiments. So what we can see here is the uh, rotation speed of the high temperature heat pump compressor and the temperature of the, the storage tank here. The operation of the high temperature heat pump uh, was uh, done by the, the limits of the temperatures here in the storage tank. So this is was the on and off of the high temperature heat pump, which can be depicted quite uh, well by the simulation model. We can see that the control of the rotation speed is also depicted quite well, and there is sometimes a short lag uh, between the simulation and the experiment, but the trend is quite well shown. You can also see that the decrease of the storage temperatures here in the, the simulation model and the experiment uh, differ slightly, but it's it's quite well. And during uh, the operation of the cleaning in place system, we have a good match. So what's coming next on our demonstrator is that uh, we are also working together with work package five, what was uh, presented by Massimiliano before. So in the next steps, we will do some further work on the monitoring and the modeling. So to also integrate further consumers because uh, we saw that the heat pump was not in operation the, the whole day, so there is a capacity left, and we would like to optimize the uh, operation of the heat pump and to also work on this made smart data systems with our uh, demonstrator, so to have a clear and simple visualization of the measurement data, automatic data preparation, and to achieve a communication between the plant and the simulation model. And finally, uh, what we can say is that uh, the work on on this demonstrator and this uh, project here enough is uh, quite of importance because uh, our uh, project already got an award uh, for for the work we have already conducted. So we got the the Energy Globe uh, Sturia Award. So it's more or less an award on a federal state basis uh, in in Austria, and we were also nominated for the Energy Globe Austria Award. And uh, we also won uh, the Energy Club Austria in the category fire. And this shows the importance of the work here in, 
in enough and uh, what we are doing currently doing uh, on our demonstrator and and on all the demonstrators are in in enough so i'm i'm very honored to to be part of this demonstrator and and to be part of this project and uh, if you want to have uh, more details about our demonstrator there are all ready free publications on on the work we have conducted and uh, if you have any questions uh, i can try to answer some of them now if, if we have a few minutes left and otherwise uh, you can contact us or matthias plaza from from equans thank you very much thank you very much uh, philip uh, very good very interesting to hear um unfortunately we don't have the uh, time to take questions now but i see there is one question for you in the chat so maybe you can answer that there and maybe there comes others as well um so i think we will now move on to the next presentation by inma it's about policy brief and the report on national policies. And you are muted. Yes, thank you very much, Christina. I am going to present you working package seven, policy strategy and advice to achieve the targets. And uh, I am the world uh, the world package leader, and um, have been working with um, the team in the uh, at the University of Göttingen, Jana Dantas and Armando Torres, and in Sintef, Sepide, Marta and Maitri. Then, what we are doing in this working package is to review, analyze, and identify the gaps in policy measures in order to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 in the food value chain. And um, we have been uh, completing up to now the task 7-1, where we have reviewed the current EU policies and also other initiatives by other stakeholders like uh, the industry the um, uh, and also the consumers. And we have deal also with the analysis of food standards and financial mechanisms. And the rest of the tasks that we will perform over the next years are going to be to analyze the initiatives and relate them to the inventory of emissions that uh, is, is going to be done by Working Package 1. And we also aim to identify the policy gaps to achieve the climate neutral food business and supply chains, design and evaluate the feasible policy interventions. And finally, we'd like to engage with EU policymakers through interviews and workshops in the final stage of the project. Then the completed activities have been to define the main goal by identifying the policies, regulations, the standard eco labels, financial, industrial and consumer initiatives. We have we have collected data at both the EU levels and for selected um, countries at the national level. We have also categorized the data according to the stages in the supply chain and the food sectors that are also used in other working packages, and we have to analyze the data and the interlinks between the policy and uh, initiatives collected and the sustainable development goals, as well as the for, uh, farm to fork strategy. Then, uh, in particular, we have collected and classified 28 policies and regulations at the European uh, Union level. Then uh, 27 financial mechanisms that uh, are supposed to finance all these activities to reduce emissions. 20 standards and eco labels that are related as, for example, you have this one here, ISO TS4067 related to greenhouse gases and uh, the carbon footprint of products. We also have collected 18 industrial initiatives related to specific subsectors of the food chain and 13 consumer initiatives that are supposed to, uh, to make consumers more aware of the fact that we need to reduce energy use and, and also to decarbonize. Uh, 
you have some uh, examples here, policies that very important uh, that are very important are the European Green Deal, of course, as well as the Farm to Fork strategy of the European Union. But also we have countries like Norway or the UK that is not anymore in the European Union. Therefore, we also uh, revise the policies on, uh, in, the, in these very countries. Uh, important, we have uh, collected all these initiatives that are available or will be available in the website of the project and uh, this is already done, but uh, we have a recent update, so therefore we will again uh, put this available on the website in an Excel file that is interactive. Then here, just to show you what are the supply chain stages and the food sectors that we have been used for this categorization. And those are, I won't repeat them because they have been already mentioned in previous working packages, but you can see there that, uh, that we have this classification. We also use it. And in some cases, the initiatives, especially the, the policies and regulations are at a upper level. So therefore the food uh, value chain is included but it's not the only one, but other industries are also part of many of the regulations and, and industrial initiatives that are uh, in place in order to decarbonize. Then as uh, already starting or, or early outcomes of the project, we have three scientific contributions. The first one has been to um, relate and those initiatives that we have uh, collected from the perspectives of multi-stakeholders and then relate them to the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular to the SDG 12, Sustainable Production and Consumption. And um, this, um, this outcome will be a chapter in a series called Implementing the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Regional Perspectives, and we are in, in charge of the European Perspective, and this is going to be published by Springer, already accepted. Then in, in there, we have also linked emissions with food chain stages and the firm to fork. And as a part of the what we did is this, uh, this Sankey diagram where you can see the different gases on the Y axis and there in the X axis, you can see the also the system stage and the system phase where the emissions are released. And uh, the white of the colors means, of course, the importance of, of each of the different gases in the, in the production. I wouldn't go into it because we don't have enough time, but you can also, of course, access this in the corresponding publication and, and later on also in our website. Then uh, we have also identified among the policy strategies um, and the initiatives three waves on uh, on the process of uh, elaborating those initiatives, whereas in the early 2000 there were no financial mechanisms and then the industrial initiatives were mostly based on competitiveness and innovation and the consumer initiatives on consumer rights and improved food access in the 20 uh, in the 2005 2017 things changed and more financial mechanisms were in place that you can see there in the second column as well as industrial initiatives related also to climate resilient food production and mostly to sustainability and consumer initiatives started to be also related to reduce food, food waste and to make consumers aware of of, of the importance of these actions and at present times, after 2018, then uh, other financial mechanisms are available in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And also the industrial initiatives started to include emission reductions as, as a very important part of their business strategies, as well as to obtain sustainable food systems and to inform consumers about their own strategies to uh, achieve the Green Deal objectives. And consumers um, are supposed to be now more aware of uh, the necessity of have uh, action for, for the green transition. And also consumer initiatives are being focused more and more on educational level and also on the fact that consumers have to be aware of the need of decarbonization in the food supply chains and their action as consumers is very, very important. Then our second scientific contribution is uh, 
a paper about sustainable food value chains in the European Union. And uh, in this case, this, this was presented in the fifth symposium on agri-tech economics uh, for sustainable futures in Harper Adams University, and is part of the proceedings of, those, of this conference. And um, the idea is uh, how those policies are going to be linked to the specific targets in the sustainable development goals more in general. And those are the ones that were mentioned by Christina at the very beginning of, of this um, webinar. And finally, the third contribution is going to be a brief letter that is already finished, but still we are in the process of making it uh, available. And there we are going to again show the best way towards the food supply chain decarbonization. And we focus on what are the main challenges for the European policies and the stakeholders' initiatives, and we were trying to identify already the gaps that are uh, there and how those gaps can be filled in the in the future time. The current activities that we are now uh, taking away taking then is first uh, to analyze uh, how consumers um, already react to to these uh, new developments, and for this we are using the responses in the Eurobarometer. That uh, now in the 2021 edition they have also questions specifically related to uh, sustainable food systems, and one of the very related questions is asking uh, citizens whether where they are eating um, healthy and sustainable a healthy and sustainable diet and you can see how part of of them answer always but very few whereas others answer mo most of the time but others only from time to time or never and therefore we want to integrate uh, this with the consumer initiatives that we have evaluated and see whether those consumer initiatives have an effect or an impact or not trying to see uh, countries in which those um, initiatives were more active where the uh, associations of consumers have been more active where this has an influence in consumer behaviors and also we can differentiate by different uh, groups of citizens according to the income level or according to the age and the education level in order to identify what consumers should be target in order to make them more aware when they are not about the need of changing consum consumption habits. Then another important question in this Eurobarometer is uh, when you buy food, what is the most important for you? And uh, we have uh, distinguished this color like a, uh, like a traffic light, red, yellow and green. And the red are related to cost and, and uh, convenience and shelf life avail availability. Therefore, those are not very much related to, uh, to awareness towards sustainability and decarbonization. The yellow color means that consumers are uh, mostly worried about food safety, taste, uh, nutrients content and the like, and the red one, sorry, and the green one is when they uh, really care about ethics and beliefs and uh, about where the, the food comes from and the environment and climate. So therefore, we want to identify what consumers are the ones that have this uh, green light and what consumers are in the more in the in the other two um, lights of the of the traffic light. Um, simultaneously, we are elaborating a survey directed to the industry, to the producers' perception on sustainable food systems, and the idea is to assess the potentials to achieve zero net emissions in industrial opera operations. And for this, we are uh, we took as a blueprint some um, some questionnaires that are already in place uh, that were uh, um, done by the World Bank and the Enterprise Survey to businesses in North uh, Africa and Asia. And we are taking some questions from there and others we are elaborating them. The idea is to target EU food companies, large and SMEs, and also uh, use the enough uh, partners and networks in order to launch the questionnaires. The type of questions that we are going to, well, the questionnaire is, is ready. We are going to send it now for uh, comments uh, to the partners and the sort of questions we are 
we are having are uh, can be um, can be put in these three groups: sustainability, energy, and standards. And the idea is to assess all the potentials to achieve net zero emissions in industrial operations, asking them whether the company has a sustainability department, if they offer green products, for example, in terms of sustainability, energy. The idea is to ask them whether they monitor energy consumption or not, if they have targets concerning CO2 emissions and also some other questions related to standards. And uh, finally, our current activities also include targeting future scientific contributions and there is a special issue in frontiers in sustainability and the idea will be to send part of our outcomes coming from the from the cons uh, consumers uh, for the uh, from the cons consumers and and the industry questionnaires to to this um, to this publication and also we are going to try to um, to identify industrial policies and to see what is the industrial policy framework in the countries covered under the lens of the European food value chain and uh, also concerning policies and regulations we have identified national initiatives that have been provided by enough partners and we are now analyzing them as well and here you have just a few examples of the type of national policies and regulations that mostly come in many uh, in many cases when the countries are in the European Union. Uh, it depends on how the countries apply the, the EU directives and if they are not like Norway, then they have their own laws, of course. Just to, to give you an example, uh, in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, then countries have a specific uh, medium term targets and Germany has, for example, 65% reduction in 2030 compared to 1990, whereas France uh, has only 40% and Norway is uh, also a bit more ambitious, 50 to 55 in 2030. And um, those differences, of course, are important because even uh, achieving these targets in the medium term is going to be difficult to achieve the target of zero net emissions by 2050. Then this is all I, I wanted to, to tell you more or less. And of course, I will be happy to receive comments and questions either by email or, or through the, the chat uh, now um, during the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very, very good. I think we'll just move on to, to the last uh, presentation, which is uh, from me. Share it. Yes. Um, uh, so I will t talk about uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, with sister projects in, in the EU. Uh, but I will start with this one, this you saw uh, before also. Um, and you have heard uh, quite a lot of different uh, activities in the from the other uh, work packages. Uh, and, and hopefully you also understand that we, we have quite a lot of, of collaboration within the project. Uh, and, and also more than what is visualized here. So if we go back to, to this list, we ha have at the bottom here cooperation. It says cooperation with the European Commission, but it's not only cooperation or collaboration with the project officer. Of course, we inform the project officer about this, but uh, what we are doing. But we also have collaboration with, with others at the Commission and with other EU projects. Uh, and to explain that a little bit, I will we'll start with the European Green Deal. So climate change and environmental degradation are uh, existential threats to Europe and the world. And to over overcome uh, these challenges, the European Union has then launched this European Green Deal, which is a roadmap uh, for making Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. So when doing that, we have to ensure that uh, no net emissions of greenhouse gases by uh, 2050, but also uh, economic growth decoupled from resource use and no person and no place left behind. And the Green Deal provides solutions for, for several sectors. So it's environment and energy, transport, waste, buildings, food, 
uh, education in industry and I have included uh, some links here you will receive the you'll be able to look it up afterwards also there is also a video here but of course there's a lot of information online if you want to know more about the green deal uh, within the green deal there are uh, many projects uh, that works uh, to, toward the, the goals and that that's uh, and therefore they have started something called green deal support office uh, and it's more important that the, all these projects are not working separated from its, each other, but also gain from each other. Uh, and therefore, this support office will facilitate coordination between projects. It will also provide networking and knowledge exchange. And I have written here policies, but it's on other things. But I think we it's 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 maybe uh, more clear on the policies that we can work together. Uh, and, and uh, they are also going to help projects to communicate the results uh, and we can also do that together to find the right stakeholders and find new sources of funding because that is also actually some something that we are supposed to do within the enough, enough project to 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 come up with new projects and, and start parallel pro projects. So I'm very happy if you if you have uh, if you start a new project which are in the same topic as uh, as enough that you share the information with with me because that's also part of the the reporting uh, later. So uh, uh, within the support office of the Green Deal, I have divided into different uh, topics, and we are naturally within food and health, and within that the, the, this the, there is this food working group where nine projects are are involved you see here we are on this one uh, so now i have a, a short presentation of the, of the other sister projects so i have collected information from presentations at webinars where i have attended i have also looked at at the websites and i have tried to to draw out some some keywords which you see in these green bubbles and then i have tried to come up with at least uh, one uh, idea for collaboration with enough. But of course, all these projects are really big and you know that, that there is a lot of other information. And so, and I also think that there are some representatives in, in this webinar from the others. So uh, it uh, would be interesting if you, if you want to add some more information, some more keywords um, in the chat here, or if, if you or someone from enough sees uh, another, possibility of collaboration, you can also uh, add that in the chat. And this is a work that's more or less starting now. So, so uh, we will come back to that and we will also have um, a working group on, on this collaboration. And what you might think is that, okay, but are we now adding more work to already a very long list of things that we have to do within enough? So no, it's not that. It's, it, it's, it's supposed to uh, find we are supposed to find where it's more efficient to work together than working separately and I think that is uh, again within the policies but also communication and communication with stakeholders I mean, mainly so going to the the first of the sister projects is agro to circular they're working with uh, converting waste into high value products uh, and some keywords are uh, improving circular economy upcycling of organic agri-food waste and also upcycling of plastic agri-food waste and reduction of fossil fuels and, and a possible link with enough could be within packaging. Uh, next is eco-efficient. They are making, making the fish processing side streams sustainable and efficient. efficient. And uh, some keywords are then improve circular economy, recycling fishing gear, I also think they are working with aquaculture. Uh, also, uh, within the project, they are looking at providing fertilizers and biodiesel. And again, packaging might be a link with enough here. Uh, Zero W is uh, including the whole uh, value chain from harvest and pre-harvest to consumption and uh, working with uh, reducing food loss and waste. And they are uh, aiming at just transition and uh, working with data driven solutions and also uh, innovative packaging. And I think food, reducing food loss and waste is something that is important for the enough as well. And, and, and again, here, packaging might also be a link. 
The next product, Sisters, is a little similar to, to the previous one. They're also working with reducing food loss and waste and, and uh, the, the whole food value chain. And uh, they also want to improve food shelf life and reduce indirect CO2 emissions. And again, food loss and waste could be an interesting link. PESNU is uh, working with reducing pesticides and fertilizer use. Uh, so they are focusing on the on a production uh, phase. Uh, also want to improve food yield, deliver full organic farming, and at the same time, reduce production costs. Uh, we have not mainly included the production phase in, in our project, but might be some linking with the heating and cooling during uh, farming. Uh, New Giant, uh, I think it's a bit similar to, to the previous one. Uh, they are working with reducing synthetic antibiotics by using uh, grape extracts. So also working with environmental friendly product products and improving circular economy. Uh, have not uh, seen a clear link to enough uh, yet, but we will see when we develop this further. Uh, next one, clean farms, also on production level, and they are uh, working with integral environmental sustainability, innovative systemic solution space, low carbon energy production and consumption, and also developing a network of farmers. Um, and maybe also here heating and cooling during farming could be a possibility. Uh, so the last uh, Oh, in this list is uh, school food for change. So they are shifting school meals and schools into a new paradigm by addressing public health and territorial, societal and environmental resilience. So working with healthy and sustainable diets. But they also have in the middle of this uh, figure is here whole school food approach. So as I understand it, it's not only looking at the school food, but the whole society around and how it affects uh, the rest of the families. and uh, yeah community and and maybe heating cooling during preparation of food is is uh, something that we can link the products together so this uh, green deal support office they have come up with a, a suggestion for an action plan with four uh, different chapters or points here so the first one was uh, policy which i have also mentioned there are policy offices at the european commission we we should uh, know what, what to to what kind of information we should serve them with and, and if we should go do it together or, or separately. Uh, also knowledge sharing and dissemination and, and different events. I, I, I have uh, joined some workshops and webinars uh, and also some others from Enough have, have done that and, and there are more to come. So I think that is a good way. And we also, as I said, invited them, them to this webinar. And then we can maybe also collaborate on the technical operation and research cooperation uh, level. Uh, and I have uh, planned to, to start uh, to, uh, to have a um, presentation at the uh, International Congress of Refederation next year, where we maybe start discussing a little bit about the uh, possibilities of uh, collaboration. Uh, I see now that we are at the end of uh, this meeting. Uh, I urge everybody to, if you are not already, you can follow the project on, on LinkedIn uh, and you have the web page and uh, we are, will be, as, as said, we will be present at many different uh, conferences and, and so. Uh, we also plan to have a kind of, a, a, I think, a similar uh, webinar as today, but then focusing on the demonstrators to show more uh, details from from the different uh, uh, demonstrators next year. Um, so that was it. I think I will now stop sharing and also turn off the recording.